Hello, everyone. Welcome to the course entitled Using Color in the Landscape. This course has course number 2164 and has been granted one technical or one landscape credit for your North Carolina landscape contractors licensing uh, renewal for 2022. Now, remember, this is good for one landscape or technical course for NCLCLB. It is not approved for any pesticide credit or irrigation credit. This is strictly a landscape contractor's course, and it is using color in the landscape. Now, throughout the lecture, we are going to have some check on learning um, moments, as I call them. This is... Uh, required by the board. Since this is an online course, we're going to stop and ask a question that really doesn't pertain to anything about the lecture. These will be added to the quiz. That way, the board is knowing that you guys are watching the lectures all the way through. I don't know why you wouldn't want to watch the lectures all the way through. I mean, it's some good information. Um, but anyway, those are what we call, you know, check on learning. And there will either be three or four throughout this lecture that will not pertain to any of the topics discussed in the lecture. These are just to make sure you are watching the video. So let's go ahead and jump in to using color in the landscape. Now, let's let's just talk about this picture right here. This is a, a, a good picture, you know, some apartment homes uh, in a mountain location. So look at all the colors that we are having in this landscape right away. Now, unfortunately, the most dominant color that's sticking out to me right now is the concrete. Now, that's just something that we're we're, we're going to have to get used to. Sidewalks are poured out of concrete, and yeah, they are, you know, noticeable, and they reflect a lot of the sunlight. But we have the turf grass, you know, green. We have the concrete, like we said, a, a grayish white. We have the annual beds. We have the petunias. Uh, we have, it looks like, some marigolds in the back. We have some ornamental grasses that are coming up, and it looks like some weeds possibly coming up uh in that shrub bed but then we have the different you know landscape plants we have the different trees uh you know we have the green trees in the background we have some more of the like a blue spruce there to the to the right uh and then we we have the color of the sky we have the white clouds we have the red brick we have the tan siding so there are a lot of ways to get color in the landscape we don't necessarily just have to use uh, plant materials. And, and we're in a profession, guys, where, you know, the sky is the limit when it comes to designing for uh, your, your clients. And it's, it's a fun thing that I like to do, and I like using color. Now, here in North Carolina, there is no reason that we cannot have color for our clients year-round. Not only with seasonal color, you know, meaning our flowers, you know, but with our flower beds, we should have color throughout the year, but also with the different varieties of plant materials that we have, the different varieties of, um, uh, you know, pavers that we have, the different shapes of plants that create shadows. I mean, shadows can be used as a color and an accent in a landscape as well. So, but anyway, let's go ahead and jump into the meat and potatoes of this lecture. And we're going to talk color in the landscape. Now, Dr. Ware, um, you know, a, a strong mentor of mine, uh, Dr. Uh, Sue Ann Ware, uh, when I was at North Carolina A&T State University, uh, was a mentor of mine, a good friend of mine, who taught us a lot about design. I learned more from her about design and the actual concepts of design. You know, Mr. Howard and Mr. Robinson, Dr. Glass, they taught me more of the technical side, but, but Dr. Ware, she taught me a lot of the design aspects. And I'll never forget this. We were in studio one day, and she's like, you know, what's the most predominant color in the landscape? And when I ask my clients this, or I ask my students this, you know, even today, everybody's going to say green. And, you know, it, it, technically looks like that don't it i mean even looking at this picture with the with the with the wave petunias and 
uh, you know, with the concrete, it still seems more predominantly green. But subconsciously, our mind is seeing the color purple. And but and and think about this, because I know a lot of people, you know, might be like, ah, you know, Eric's not knowing what he's talking about. But, you know, when I listened to Dr. Ware talk about this and I started studying it myself and started being like, hey, that you know, that's right. Because in landscape architecture, we use the color purple a lot of the times to render our shadows of the trees on our two dimensional plants when, you know, everything was still being used, chart pack markers and stuff, which, you know, that's coming back today as well. You know, more landscape architects are going back to those hand sketches, those color renderings of their, their plans. And I love it. I absolutely love it. But the color purple, when you look at it, let's take a look, look at the mountains in the back. It has a purple tint. You have the sky, you know, with the red brick you have the turf grass in the sky. Everything kind of modged together, you're going to have that purplish tint to it. And the further out you look in the landscape, the more purple you're going to see. So, you know, purple is one of the most dominant colors in the landscape. You know, it took me a while to understand it, but just thought I would throw that out there for you guys. Let's get started with our introduction. In the 1990s, 15% of bedding plants that were produced were for commercial landscapers. Um, you know, that's that's a big number. And I would think that it's probably, you know, increasing each year as there's more and more landscapers getting into the business, more homeowners turning over the maintenance of their properties to landscapers. So that number is going to increase. Now, homeowners still buy quite a bit of annual annuals and perennials and vegetable plants themselves. So that's still going to take place, but commercial landscapers are going to be uh, a big, big part of, you know, the retail markets and the garden centers that are selling these plants to because landscapers are going to come in and not buy one flat of annuals. They're going to come in and buy multiple flats and a lot of the times you need to contract with your local garden centers before you, you know, just walk in and buy everything on the table. They may want to to know ahead of time how many plants that you're going to use. Um, we use Jones plants a lot here in, uh, in, in our area. Uh, no kin to us at all, but, uh, you know, Zach was a student of mine, you know, years ago at the college. And, you know, his brother is a good friend of mine, and they can contract grow for us. Uh, a lot of our annuals. He's like, just let us know what you're planning on and we can grow it particularly for you. Keep it separate from the stuff that they're selling retail. And we have a readily supply of fresh annuals uh, each year. We're not having to hunt them down. The cost of annuals is an advertising expense rather than a site maintenance cost. The property managers and the owners of their stores they can actually write this. Well, they can write the maintenance off as well, but they're, they're using this as marketing. Anytime their property looks inviting and colorful, they're going to get more customers inside of their buildings. And so they want, they want this. They want everything looking good. You know, grocery stores. You know, unfortunately, there's a bunch of pavement in front of grocery stores. And so a lot of the grocery stores have implemented large pots in front of their storefronts. This not only keeps, you know, cars from getting too close to the building, but it also gives a place where they can add color. Now, a lot of the grocery stores sell annuals themselves and they can actually do it, but, you know, they may contract that contract it out with the maintenance uh, contractor to keep these beds looking good. And inside those pots, there can be a multitude of things giving us color. And like I said, here in North Carolina, we can produce color year round. We shouldn't have to hunt for color. 
I mean, we have, like I said, we see all four seasons in one day at times, but we can keep color in any type of annual bed, any type of uh, flower pot, hanging basket, or whatever. We can have some type of color. And when I say color, we don't necessarily have to think of the pinks, the reds, the purples, the whites, the yellows. We can have the green foliage. Uh, plants. We can have the green grasses. We can have the green shrubs that are coming out of them as well. Color can always be maintained in our landscapes, but we're pretty darn close to picking out color year round with our annuals. You know, pansies lasting until the spring. We kind of do our switch out around April 15th, even though April 15th, we've had some, some, some cold mornings, uh, you know, uh, up until late April. But typically April 15th is when we switch them out. But we can carry, you know, this seasonal color year-round as well. All the way up until mums with our annual, uh, summer annuals. We have our mums, and then we switch them out with, you know, the cabbages and the pansies. And they're going to last up until uh, the springtime as well, April 15th. So we can make sure that we have color in all of our clients' uh, beds. With your seasonal color program, you need to select the correct plant to the correct site. Now, what are you talking about here, Eric? Well, for one, I'm talking about know your annuals, know your perennials. If you've watched the lecture, uh, Do You Know How to Prune?, we talked about plant identification. You need to know what it is that these annuals like. There are some annuals that like wet feet. Begonias need a ton of water. So we need to plant them somewhere that we've got irrigation or somewhere that the beds might naturally stay wet. If we have a site that doesn't have irrigation and it's hard for us to get water on site, maybe we need to go with something like a vinca, which can tolerate more drier soils than some of the other annuals. You need to know your annuals. A lot of the times, new green industry professionals go to the garden center and they're like, man, that's blooming pink. I want it. My client's going to love me. They're going to think I'm an expert. But really, they don't, they don't know what the plan is. They couldn't tell the client the name of it. And definitely, they're not going to be able to know the habitat of the plant. How much water does it need? How many do you need to plant per square feet? Are they planting too little? Are they planting too much? They need to know these things. So select the plant appropriate to the site. We need to have good bed preparation. And a lot of the times people come in and just till the soils up. They're not adding any, uh, adding any amendments. They're not doing any soil testing. They're not doing anything to the soil. They are just, just, you know, throwing, throwing annuals into a plowed up bed. Not a good way to do it. With your bread, bed prep, you also need to mulch, you know, immediately after planting the plants and then water them in. With your post-planting management, you know, <laughs> so many times, and, and I've been guilty of this uh, myself, you know, we plant the plants and we kind of forget about them. You can't do that. And you cannot depend on your mowing crew to check on these plants throughout the summer. I mean, we have very hot days here in North Carolina. And if you don't have irrigation, you know, week to week mowing and your mowing crew is the one checking on your annual beds, it's not going to last. You need to have a crew dedicated just for annual beds. It could be the same pruning crew. So basically, you know, and after watching, you know, do you know how to prune? We talked about having a specialized crew for that. Your specialized pruning crew could be the same crew that goes and takes care of the annual beds to keep this color, this color vigorous and, and beautiful throughout the, throughout the year for your clients. They're going to need to be weeded. They're going to need to be watered, fertilized, deadheaded. So there's all kinds of post planting, um, items that need to be taken care of or job tasks that need to be handled with these annuals because nothing looks worse than a unkept annual bed. It, you'd be better just to go ahead and sow it in grass and mow it 
if you're not going to take care of your annuals. They are picky, they are finicky, and you need to have a dedicated crew going around uh, and 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 doing this for your properties. And we had a student, probably one of my first students in in the first year, um, taking my classes, and she um, graduated, built her own greenhouse. I'm going to, you know, refrain from saying the, the student's name for protection, but she had the best idea ever. And she wanted to get into wedding planning. So she knew she had to grow flowers and, you know, the stuff for that. And that was kind of her niche. And it's what she really loved and what drew her into the green industry. But she also came up with an idea after taking this class. I've been presenting this lecture, guys, at the college for several years. And she bought a Zuzu NPR box body. And she put her shelving in it. And she started growing a bunch of annuals. And she sent out a letter because this was before the days of social media. Uh, I mean, it was just catching on, but she sent out a letter to all the other landscapers and, and registered landscape contractors at the time and said, Hey, I'm offering a annual bed service where we can grow the plants. We can plant them and we will do weekly maintenance on the beds. It was perfect. She just got a ton of clients right away. She actually got too big too fast and, you know, couldn't keep up with the demand. You know, had to hire more people, you know, get another truck. But this was a really, really good concept. Kind of like pruning, you know, subcontracting your pruning out. You could subcontract out your bed maintenance. Because it is, if you're cutting grass six days a week, you don't have time to go and maintain these beds. So you'd want to hire somebody like her to actually grow it, install it, design it, then put them in, and then do the weekly maintenance on it. And she had a big water tank that she pulled around to and was watering it. And I actually seen her out at Five Points one day. She was planting all the flowers uh, there at the local bank. And I'm like, holy cow, you took off and ran with it. And then she came and visited the college. And she's like, yes, she said, I am covered up with annual decor services. So good, good, uh, good to see my students out there kicking butt doing stuff like that with annuals. They, they live one growing season, you know, they are one and done, you know, kind of like Kentucky basketball. So, you know, he gets them in there and gets them to the NBA and I'm sorry, I like the university of Kentucky basketball. Um, everybody's like, why do you like that? They're not finishing school and stuff. Most of those NBA uh, guys, they do come back and finish their degree. Well, but they live one season, one growing season. Some can survive the winter. Yes, you know, and it's you'll you'll notice that when you go to change out your flowers that you might see, um, you know, some some petunias left from last year, or you might see a pansy, you know, sticking its head up out of the soil. Uh, when we're going in with, you know, mums or whatever, they're able to survive. They're able to survive the whole year. You're going to have these few plants that can, uh, that are just, you know, tough little guys and gals that, that'll make it. Um, but annuals, it's the least expensive way to brighten a dull landscape and to attract attention. And again, commercial property owners, They want that attention. So they're going to want to have their annuals around their signage out front because that color is going to draw your eyes to the signage. And it's just, it's an advertising expense. And you really need to, to, to pump up your annual decor game. Um, even though you are uh, just a mowing company or you're just an installation company, this is a good sideline business that people are willing to pay. This is based on emotions. And anytime you can sell something on emotions, people will spend the money. They want that color in their front yard. They want that color at their commercial building. They want people's attention. And you want their money. With perennials, they're going to live more than one growing season, three or more. They can survive the winter, and there is a broad palette of plants to choose from. 
And I remember in undergraduate in, in landscape architecture, Dr. Glass was having us do a perennial bed border. And um, I, I, you know, for some reason, I got totally mixed up with that. And I did a perennial bed border with interior perennials instead of outdoor perennials. And so I remember, you know, really messing that up, but it was one of the best drawings I ever did. And she was just like, Eric, your drawings remarkably outstanding, but she's like, you totally missed the point again, following directions. I didn't do it, but every time I hear the word perennial, I'll always remember Dr. Glass, uh, you know, in that perennial bed border project that we had to do. But again, they live for more than one year. They'll survive that winter. And there is a multitude of colors to choose from. Now, perennials, they uh, not only have the flower, you know, the colorful flowers, but a lot of their foliage will have some color to it, or they'll have different tints of the green. And just the design of their leaf and their foliage is worth having in the yard. And this is a perfect example of a perennial uh, bed, you know, with all the different colors. You know, you got the purples, the pinks, the yellows, the orange, and and then you have that, you know, different monochrome colors of green uh, within the bed itself. With design, do not use too many colors. This is when more is less. You need, to, you need to focus on a certain palette and stick with it. Now, if you like all the colors, there's nothing wrong with splitting up the colors, you know, front to back, you know, left side, right side. But if you're going to be in the back, you want uh, your colors to be within the same palette. It kind of goes back to you never plant a red azalea up against red brick or you never plant a white azalea in front of a white vinyl siding house. You're not doing any justice of the plants by doing that. And you're not doing your, your customers any favors. They're spending the money. They're wanting the color. They want something that's going to pop. You know, put that pink blooming azalea, um, you know, in front of the white vinyl side and put the, put the uh, white blooming azalea in front of your red brick. Never have that clash. Same thing can happen with your annuals. However, I do like the mixture of pansies that we can get in the wintertime. So having that array of pansy colors is probably the only time that I'll let that go. But with your commercial properties, they usually require simple color schemes. They like the red and the blue, possibly the white, you know, for the American colors. They do like the color yellow, uh, but they're going to stick to more of the traditional uh, colors, probably none of the pastels or anything like that. It's probably going to see more in your residential properties, but these residential properties, they do benefit from more of a variety and color and texture commercial, you know, property managers and, and, uh, business owners, they, they like it simple. They like it beautiful, but they want it, you know, real neat and clean. They don't want too much, uh, you know, stuff going on because they're, their only reason they're using color guys in the landscape is to draw that, you know, potential customers eyes to that color bed and then look up and see their signage for their pizza parlor or for their, you know, nail salon or, you know, the barber shop. They're getting attention from this color. With the cool colors, and, you know, reading all this, it kind of reminds me of the wine colors, uh, but these are reds with a blue tint, burgundy. I love burgundy. As you can see, I'm wearing a burgundy shirt. It's the color of our landscape company. Rose, pink, magenta, purple, violet, lavender, blue, and navy. All of these are your cool colors. So if you're going to design a bed with the cool colors in mind, Stick to these colors. They go really well together. You wouldn't want to throw any warm colors uh, in with your pinks and your purples. It's just going to clash. 
Now, again, that goes back to D school, design school. They're going to teach you that stuff. You're going to study more of these color palettes and which goes well together and which doesn't. It's kind of the same way interior designers design their spaces. You know, certain colors just clash. Keep your cool colors together and keep your warm colors together. And here are your warm warm colors. These are your reds with an orange tint. You can have just good old orange, you know, Clemson colors. Gold, yellow, rust, and even peach. Now, I just told you to keep warm colors and purple colors separate. But I'm writing this lecture after watching a wonderful weekend of basketball. You know, NCAA tournaments going on, and Duke and Carolina play each other in the Final Four for the first time in history. And so I see a lot of people, people's pride come out of their schools. And they're very proud of it, and they're very loud about where they went to school. And Carolina fans being one. But we've actually designed color in people's landscapes based on knowing where they went to college. And I'm sitting here looking at these warm colors and I'm looking at these blue colors or the cool colors and I'm seeing orange here and I'm seeing purple in the previous. If you have a Clemson tiger client this is the one time you might want to mix warm and cool season. You do the purple and orange, and you do it with a theme throughout their entire backyard. Because you can make that happen with annuals. You can make that happen with azaleas. You can make that happen with rhododendron. And they're going to really like you for that. You've taken the time to figure it out to figure out what it is that they like, where they went to school, and you can do that. So, guys, remember, color is unlimited on certain occasions for certain clients. Don't, don't be scared to, to get bold and do something different out there. And with your design, the pastel colors, you're going to use in areas viewed mainly in the evening. Why? It's because they're going to lighten it up. You can use them in shady areas. Again, it's going to lighten them up. Your pastel colors will reflect a lot of that light that is that is being shown into the darker areas, the shady areas, or in the evenings. They're going to reflect what light is there. These impact areas that you're going to use, entryways into uh, the building, entryways into the neighborhood, into the office park, or any any type of entryway, you would want to have some seasonal color. You're going to want to put them around signs. We've already talked about that because, you know, the people that own the commercial buildings, they're all about drawing attention to the signage out front, letting, letting them know what's, what's in their shopping center. And I've always said this, if I own a pizza place and – the drive-by traffic cannot see my signage and know that I'm in the shopping center when I'm paying that much in retail rental space, I'm going to be upset. I'm going to be like, hey, landlord, we need some color out there. I want people's eyes drawn to the signs. Outdoor eating areas. And you're seeing that. You know, we went to, to, to Village Tavern over the weekend. You know, all the, the pots that they've got setting out there. You know, they've got their, their winter annuals in it now, and they've got some evergreens. But here very soon, in a couple of weeks, it's going to be full of seasonal, new, warm season annuals or, or your, your summer annuals. Entertainment areas. Outdoor Outdoor areas. This morning on the radio, Turf Up Radio, we talked about small space landscaping and using containers. Perfect for annuals. You're, you're bringing guests over. You're hanging out in your back patio, your outdoor room, your outdoor kitchen. You want that color. Putting them in pots is a perfect way to do it. Or anywhere people congregate in public spaces. 
if it's outside outside dining, if it's you know outside seating, if it's you know public parks, wherever people are hanging out, you're wanting to use commercial color, seasonal color. All right, now guys, we're about halfway through the lecture, so one of the uh, uh, you know kind of the check on learning to make sure uh, that you guys are watching the videos. Uh, the question that I have, uh, because I drink coffee all day long, what is the turf teacher's favorite coffee? Now, my favorite coffee is Black Rifle Coffee. So that is going to be a question. It's not Folgers. It's not Sanka. It's not Starbucks. It's Black Rifle Coffee because I support those guys being a veteran myself and, you know, the money and the services that they provide for you know, our veterans is just amazing. So I support them because they support uh, us. So Black Rifle Coffee is your first check on learning question. And so now let's still talk a little bit about design. And the most common bedding plants that we use in our landscapes, impatience, which we see right here, you know, beautiful. And there again, you know, look, those, those are your cooler colors. You know, they're not your reds and orange. They're your, your, your pinks and light pinks and white, your pastel colors. That is going to really light up that, that, that bed in the evening. We have begonias, you know, more of a waxy looking foliage. You know, you can almost, when you plant them and you rub them together, you can hear that squeakiness in the, in the foliage. You know, your marigolds, which I love, you know, late summer, uh, just because, you know, because it's reminding me that fall is right around the corner and we're getting ready to change it out to mums and, and uh, you know, our pansies, petunias, you know, the purple wave petunias. Remember that used to be a kick. You would plant that with, uh, um, you know, either the wandering Jew or the sweet potato vine, and then you would do, uh, some of the purple fountain grass in the back. I mean, that's what we used to see forever. Uh, and you know, those were, I think used a little too much. So, you know, people kind of gotten away from that mixture, but they, they're still good inside the pots, uh, and everything. Uh, annual Vinca, you know, perfect for areas that is lacking irrigation or sufficient rainfall. Uh, they can go week to week, you know, with, with a little bit of water. Um, this is a plant that if you're having to depend on your mowing crews to, to check out your, uh, annual beds, you would want them, uh, you would want them to, to plant the, the vinca in, in the shrub beds. But again, this goes back to knowing our plant materials, ladies and gentlemen, impatience, they need shade and they need water. Begonias, they need full sun and they need water. Marigolds, you know, good for, for deer, you know, keeping deer away. So, um, you know, plant them in spots, but they need full sun. Petunias, you know, they do better in full sun and they're going to need their water. Vinca prefers full sun and is going to do, uh, you know, pretty good without uh, as much irrigation as some of the other annuals. So, again, know your plants and know what it is. Um, or know what habitat it is that, that these plants need. Locate color beds away from the street and parking lot curbs to reduce heat stress and salt pollution from snow operations. Now, you know, we don't really have to worry about the, you know, salt pollution here in North Carolina. I mean, yes, we did have a couple of storms uh, this year, this past winter, that we did have to go out and apply ice melt. Uh, but it's nothing like up north, guys. Um, so I think we're okay uh, to plant up against the curb. But the, the one thing about that is it may distract drivers. If you do one heck of a design in an annual bed, you, you want people's attention, but you, you don't want so much attention that it takes the driver's eyes off the roads. Uh, so, so be careful, uh, with that, but you know, uh, the heat from the parking lot, yes, is going to be an issue. That's why you see a lot of grasses, uh, planted in those areas. Uh, you, we just don't see that many annuals planted in the parking lots. 
with a 12 month color program here in North Carolina, like I said, we can, we can make, uh, you know, our properties gorgeous for 12 months out of the year. We're going to get six months out of our pansies. We're going to get late October, uh, through, you know, the end of April, maybe first of May. It's, it's kind of funny. Um, you know, the pansies start looking good about the time we take them out and plant with summer annuals. I've never really understood that, but you know, pansies sometimes can, you know, depending on when they're planted in the fall can just have a bad start. You know, pansies like the water, but they like to dry out. They, they don't want to sit in water. So if we've got a wet winter, we're going to have some poor looking pansies. Now, if we're getting sufficient rainfall, and there's days in between the storms and the soil dries out and we have some cooler nights. Pansies just like cold, sunny, dry feet, dried out feet. They, they want to get wet when they get dry, but they love that sunny, cold weather. Bulbs gives us, you know, a multitude of colors. And we could have bulbs, you know, pretty much you know, several times during the year, not just the spring. These bulbs, you know, can can give us some color throughout the year. Mums, you know, early fall, uh, but you know, they're 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 expensive and you know the return on investment may not be as good uh, as some of the other ones just because of their short bloom time. And a lot of people make the mistake, especially in the commercial settings, of planting mums where they get no darkness. Mums need eight hours of darkness to keep blooming. If not, they're going to bloom out. They need the darkness. And a lot of times people will plant them in parking lots or the entrances to, uh, you know, commercial properties that have landscape lighting around them and they're not getting the sufficient dark time that they need. Uh, people are going to a lot of the flowering cabbage and kale. They're using this uh, in conjunction with the pansies and violas, and we're creating that you know wonderful array of colors throughout the winter. And this helps a lot with people's you know mental uh, stress, guys. When you walk outside from your office or you walk outside of your your house and you're you're in your yard or you're walking out to the car from work and you see this color it just helps people feel better and with all the stress and everything that we've been through with covid and and people's depression you know companies are wanting to spend more money on this annual decor uh, to help to help people's mental state all right guys i want to do another check on learning um and again, like I said, these questions have nothing to do with the lecture. They're just to make sure that you're watching it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a lot easier in a live, you know, webinar class because I can say, hey, everybody raised their hand. But these, I ask the questions just to, so, just to know that you're still in the lecture. Uh, but what branch of service did the turf teacher serve? Was it the Navy? Was it the Army? Air Force or Marine Corps? Or was it a combination? But the turf teacher served in both the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Army. I joined the Navy right out of high school. Well, I went to college for one year and then joined the Navy and then finished up that uh, contract, got out for a little bit, and then joined the Army Reserve. So I've served both the Navy and Army. That is one of your check on learning questions. All right. With your cost bloom ratio... This is the cost of the plant plus the maintenance divided by the days of effective floral display. And which plant has a high cost bloom ratio? It's your mums because they are expensive. And the maintenance, you know, you're going to have to deadhead some of them. You're going to just have to check on them. They require a lot of maintenance. But look at this bed. I know why people plant them. I know why people plant them. They're gorgeous. Now, it's also a little strange seeing some pansies in front of them because the pansies are quite big. Pansies are quite big. So they're, th this is, you know, possibly not North Carolina because pansies, you know, usually, uh, you know, grow uh, in the cooler temperatures. Well, we still got leaves on the trees and stuff right there. So, um, uh, 
Uh, I need to figure out where this was actually taken at. But, you know, the mums are gorgeous, but they're going to be here and they're going to be gone very, very quickly. So uh, it, it does cost us quite a bit of money for those short periods of days that we have them. With installation, select and use only quality plants. Sale packs are the most common size sold. Uh, commercial sites may want four to six inch pots, and I would much rather do that on our commercial properties is use the larger ones. It just gives, uh, it takes less time for, for the annuals to cover the entire bed. You need to contact the grower three to six months out and let them know what it is that you're going to need. You don't want to just walk in and say, hey, I need 100 flats of this and 200 of that. And they're going to look at you and like, I can't sell you that because I've got all these retail customers. So contact them three to six months out and let them know what it is um, that you're wanting. You know, it may require a small down payment, uh, but, you know, at least you're guaranteed to have your product. And, you know, with with COVID these past couple of years, a lot of this stuff was hard to find because people were spending money on their landscapes. With installation, your bed prep, the soil needs to be tilled 8 to 16 inches down. Organic matter needs to be incorporated to 20 to 25% of the volume of the root zone and two inches of the soil is tilled to eight inches. You can add things like leaf mold, compost, peat moss, and manure, and you need to till them in. And I like this. You know, we got the young man there tilling them up. He's using a small rotor tiller. He's getting that soil uh, good and uh, prepped. You can see the irrigation head that's in there, and there's probably another one over there. I can see it now. So yeah, we see two pop ups, which is going uh, to to keep the um, keep the the annuals and perennials moist. And the one thing that I see back there, I do see a light, and I know it's shining up on the building, the sign there in front of the brick wall. But that may be enough light that you do not want to plant mums there. You don't want to plant the mums there, but that's a pretty big bed. And as we've talked here, you know, at the beginning of the lecture and throughout the lecture, this color bed is drawing your eyes towards the signage. They want people to see what the name of the office complex or the subdivision is. With your fertilizer, it needs to be added at bed preparation. You're going to add one to two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet of bed space as a complete low nitrogen fertilizer with the ratio of one to two to one or one to one to one or one to two to two or something very similar. Now, Osmocote is a good uh, way or a good fertilizer to use. Now, back in the day, we used to, to buy Osmocote in these little bitty bags, or we would buy little um, Ziploc bags, not the cheap ones, but the actual nice ones, and put a little bit of Osmocote in there, and we would staple our flyers to it. Now, this was the day before Facebook marketing and all that stuff, uh, but we would you know, give a little bit of Osmocote away, and on one side of the fly, uh, flyer, it told how to use the Osmocote, and then on the other side was a flyer for for the services that we offered. And so, you know, when you're putting that flyer, throwing the flyer out the window, it, it takes the flyer into the yard and it gives the client something to use. You know, uh, you know, they're not just having to throw the flyer away. They're getting something in return. Most annuals and perennials can tolerate a soil pH range of five to seven or slightly higher. Uh, do not... Plant warm season summer annuals until the danger of frost is past us uh, or the soil is warmed up in the late spring. Now, like I said earlier, uh, we're having some cooler nights past April 15th. That used to be the day that we could plant annuals. We weren't going to have any more frost. But, you know, here lately we've had some situations. We've had to cover our strawberries past April 15th. We never thought we would have to do that, but there are times that we have to do it. Mulch only about half inch deep around the base of each plant. Now, uh, you want to do this when you plant. I like using a pine bark or like a soil conditioner for our mulch. Uh, that way, when we remove the, the, the pansies or the annuals that are starting to look bad and we're going with the next crop, 
we've already got something that we can till in to the soil. And we'll till that all in, put some more soil conditioner on, and then plant through it. And then we always need to water immediately after planting our annuals. With management, summer fertilization and irrigation, again, one to two to one, one to one to one, or similar at the rate of half a pound to one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet of bed space during the growing season. Here we have some American Green All Purpose 510 5. Beds should be higher than the surrounding turf for drainage and for visual purposes. You know, having that raised bed look is always, uh, you know, helps draw the attention to to that bed if it's the same height as the turf grass and you haven't mowed that week it may be a little hard to see all of the color uh, until the grass is mowed water by drip irrigation or by hand or even you know some small uh, wand sprinklers you know be careful with these rotors uh, guys they can really damage and knock off the blooms and actually kill uh, your seasonal color with physical care, deadheading keeps the plants vigorous. It reduces disease problems and will stimulate subsequent flowering. Again, this is when you need that crew to go around and actually do this for you. And you need to check every week for deadheading. Now, some of these are going to need, you know, water more than once a week. So your mowing crews can't do it. You need this horticulture crew that's going to do that for you. Weed control, most expensive maintenance item for seasonal color beds is the weed control because it is done by hand labor, meaning you're getting down there and you're pulling these guys. But there are three options for controlling the perennial weeds. Cultivation, again, that's getting down there and getting dirt underneath your fingernails and pulling them out. Fumigation, not practical for landscapers because we're not, one, planting through plastic, uh, and it's just too too cost prohibitive. And then there is the systemic post-emergent herbicides. We can also use a pre-emergent herbicide as well. But mulching is the least expensive method to control the weeds. But with that pine bark nuggets that I like using, the weeds are able to come through that more so than the hardwood mulch. But I just find that the hardwood mulch will burn some of these new annuals that you're planting. But please do not use black plastic. Pre-emergent, we got trifluorin, which is sold under many trade names, Snapshot being one. Uh, so, you know, we can use this snapshot, a snapshot, put it in the beds when we're planting, and that'll keep a lot of these uh, weeds from emerging. It is a pre-emergent. We've got some post-emergent herbicides that we can use, Fusillade, Ornamec, Vantage, Envoy, Acclaim. You know, your Fusillade and Vantage, you know, are for the weedy grasses. Uh, Acclaim, you know, can be used on some of the, the weedy uh, weed or some of the broadleaf weeds that we have. And when developing the plant palette, consider herbicide tolerance as well as aesthetic parameters. Again, focusing on that color. With... You know, insects and, and pest control, aphids, white flies, thrips, and mites are the most common insect problems of ornamentals. Slugs and snails can damage young plants, so poisonous baits must be used. And I would say that probably the slugs and stuff are, are more detrimental to some of these beds than the uh, aphids and stuff because they're exposed to the environment and other uh, beneficials can actually come and help you take care of those. With containers and hanging baskets, drainage is essential. They need the water, but they need to get that water out because they don't like wet feet. Fill the containers with soil to one inch of the rim for easier watering, and then fertilize once a week or two when irrigating. And these, these baskets and hanging baskets will last you throughout the entire uh, season. With herbaceous perennials, you know, plants that will survive for three or more years. Some will offer winter interest, such as the ornamental grasses. You need to deadhead them for plant vigor, increase repeat flowering, and control the reseeding. Some may need to be divided and replanted every three to four years, and some may need it every year, just depending on which perennial it is. Again, it goes back to knowing your plant materials. Ornamental grasses. 
you know, have that grass-like appearance, such as sedges used in the landscape, usually treated as annuals. Uh, they prefer full sun. They are clumping and spreading forms. So you can get them in both ways. We do have cool and warm season grasses, and foliage is the primary attribute uh, in the landscape. But I love the pink muley grass. I just love it. And we can, you know, uh, not only have it for the pink color, but just, you know, for the foliage itself and uh, when these the pink, uh, you know, turns to a light tan is, is still actually pretty, uh, in my opinion. Management for the grasses, you know, irrigation or precipitation at least one inch per week. Fertilizing, you know, half a pound to one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Cutting back uh, by hand or weed, uh, weed eater blade, um, you know, cutting them back. It's okay to use a blade on a weed eater, especially for the pampas grass, because you don't want to touch that stuff. It's it's going to cut the hands. Divide every three to four years to prevent dying in the center. And then with your cool season grasses, divide in early fall. And with your warm season grasses, divide in the early spring. With spring bulbs, tulips are the most popular. Tulips should be considered annuals. They're not going to come back. You're going to have to replant them every year. When planting the bulbs, you need to store the bulbs in a reliable dry storage at 40 degrees Fahrenheit until planting time. Uh, they should bloom 8 to 10 weeks later. When planted, space the bulb 4 to 6 inches apart with the flat side down and the pointed side up. Maintenance for your bulbs, they are a one-time display, so there is no maintenance. Remove faded flowers of bulbs that will remain for more than one season. Seed production uses carbohydrates that would otherwise be stored in the bulb, and insects and diseases seldom bother bulbs. So a good plant to have. With roses, roses is another um, niche that you could specialize in you know there's a company down in durham north carolina that you know travels all over the state taking care of people's roses we've subbed a lot of stuff out to them uh, on our commercial sites just because it was a whole lot easier they're set up to do that but it is the queen of flowers uh, stop and smell the roses plant where people can enjoy them and then uh, they are expensive for seasonal color so this is going to be some of your more wealthier clients with roses, site selection and planting them, they need five to six hours of full sun. They prefer a soil pH of 6 to 0.72. Um, if you don't have a soil test, you need to add one pound of nitrogen, either one to two to one or one to one to one complete fertilizer per thousand square feet. When managing the roses, one to two inches of rainfall or irrigation per week down to six to ten inches of the soil depth. And then fertilize at leaf out in midsummer with one pound uh, per thousand square feet with the complete fertilizer of three to one to one or two to one to two or similar ratio. With insect and disease control, they need weekly or bi-weekly spray program. They're just very susceptible to uh, disease and insects. Uh, reduced by full sun and good air circulation and can reduce by avoiding irrigation on the leaves. So you'd want to set them up on a drip irrigation. When pruning, the hybrid tea and grandiflora in spring as buds begin to swell or just after new growth. The florabunda and grandiflora should not be cut as heavy as the hybrid tea. And then prune all three at least once a week during the growing season. And do not deadhead after September to avoid winter damage. With your knockout roses, you know, they were introduced in 2000. They're winter hardy in USDA zones four or five. They tolerate in hospitable environments. As you can see here, they're in a downtown setting. They are drought tolerant, and they are very useful in the commercial landscapes. Uh, so I miss the traditional roses, though, but I understand why people are using um you know, the knockouts. And so guys, that does wrap up, uh, the lecture. We do have one more check on learning. Uh, and what college did Eric, the turf teacher go to for undergraduate? And the answer is I went to North Carolina, A and T state university guys for my undergraduate in landscape architecture. And that will conclude, 
uh, commercial color with the course number of 2164, which is good for one North Carolina Landscape Contractors Licensing Board technical or landscape credit. This course is not approved for irrigation credit or pesticide credit. It is only good for NCLC LB uh, credit. Thanks, guys, and I'll see you in the next lecture.